Hello, everybody, and welcome to Tomorrow's Space, Orbit 12.30. My name is Jared. I'm going to be your host for today's show. You probably know me from news. You also probably know that when I first came on to Tomorrow, that I was considered the astronomer of Tomorrow because that's, like, my thing. And we really don't talk much about astronomy anymore here. But today, we are having an astronomical Ask Me Anything takeover here for you all because we are being joined by Tony Darnell, one part of the deep astronomy group that we have. And Tony, thank you so much for coming on to the show today because there is just so many questions that we have to answer and I don't know <laughs> uh, half of the answers to any of them. So we're going to see uh, who knows and if we don't, we don't know. So. Awesome. Well, thanks for having me. And I just got to say, how can you have a t show called Tomorrow and not talk about astronomy for a long time? That, I, that, that baffles me. I don't know. I guess it's just not tangible to folks or something like that. So I you guys, know. yeah, okay. Just just curious. Yeah, right. I don't know. I guess you can't like really reach out and like touch it or anything uh, with it there. <laughs> so it's a little it's a little difficult. It's, it's one of those sciences where you really shouldn't touch the science because it could end pretty bad for you. Uh, so... Yeah, well, yeah, depending on how you touch it. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> so we... <laughs> went out and we asked people initially earlier this week basically what do you want us to talk about because like we like we both are here so what would you like us both to to discuss um and we have quite a few suggestions from our community and we'll just okay. go ahead and roll into some of those which one of the sort of overarching ones that a lot of people wanted to know about was the james webb space telescope um, because that's on the horizon. Uh, that is like an ultimate machine, and people always love these sort of like ultimate of the ultimates uh, that come out. So with the James Webb Space Telescope, I guess just like a little brief overview about what it is and what it's going to do. Probably the satisfying okay. bit to start. Okay, so I'll do real briefly. Uh, hold on, I hear an echo. <laughs> well, all right, I bet. it's I a pretty cool you, telescope. You, and it's going to be a space telescope, so good way to do that. Mm -hmm. All right, and Tony, I, I'm not going to be able to mime for you there, unfortunately. Okay, yeah. all right. Yeah. So there's an echo, so I'm just going to take my ear my earpieces off. Sure. <clears throat> So, uh, very briefly, the James Webb Space Telescope is meant to be a uh, successor to the Hubble Space Telescope, and it will... Um, it was supposed to launch way, way back in like 2007 or something like that. And it's been delayed and there's been all kinds of cost overruns. So now it's put, it's been pushed out to about uh, March of 2021. That's when everybody says it's going to be launched. Now, the good news is it's finished. The telescope is built and it's all put together and it's getting ready to be shipped to its launch point, which will be at the French Guyana site, uh, launch site on an Ariane 5 rocket. That'll be uh, again in March of 2021. So, it's built, it's ready to go, and the uh, telescope is huge. It's got these, yeah, there you go. You've got these segment, these, these uh, 19 segmented mirrors that are coated in with a gold coating, and they're coated in gold so that they can be really infrared or reflective in the infrared. And this telescope is much, much, much larger than what the Hubble Space Telescope uh, is capable of showing us. And so the big thing here, the big takeaway, is that JWST is going to be able to show us the um, much more further out into the distant universe. In other words, we're going to be able to see the very first stars ever to shine in the universe. And we're also going to be able to see the very first galaxies ever to form. So that's something that we don't have the capability of with right now with Hubble because it's not doesn't its mirror isn't large enough to collect enough light. So JWST is going to do that. And it's going to show us the first stars and galaxies to ever shine uh, because and, and, and give us a glimpse into the early universe, how the universe was created. But in addition to that, it's also going to help us understand a lot more about the um, nature of planets around other stars. And we call those exoplanets. And these exoplanets are... Um, uh, we now know, by, uh, based on the... Um, based on the uh, recent observations from the Kepler Space Telescope, that there are more planets in our galaxy than there are stars. So for every star, there is on average 1.6 planets around it. So there's 60% more planets in our galaxy than, than stars. And we cannot see them directly right now. No telescope that we have allows us to see them directly 
uh, with their own reflected light without uh, using some kind of special algorithms and things like that. JWST will let us see them directly. You'll be able to resolve them from the, the telescope. What's, what's more is that JWST will also allow us to um, look at the light as it leaves the star, travels through or past the planet. If the planet is between the star and us and the telescope, the light will pass through that uh, atmosphere of, the, of an exoplanet if it has one. And we'll be able to tell, first of all, if that exoplanet has an atmosphere and if it does, what's in it. And that is, as anybody who's interested in life in the universe knows, that is a crucial thing to know. What kind of chemical elements are in these atmospheres? It'd also be nice to know, sorry about that. It'd also be nice to know um, what, it would also, it would also be nice to know, I'm really sorry about this. Um, hold on. All right, we'll talk a little bit. Uh, as, as your dog there uh, seems to be adding in uh, some things. Uh, with that there. Some really cool things about the James Webb Space Telescope um, is that because it's an infrared telescope and you're going to be looking at objects with it, you have to be colder uh, than those objects. And Tony, I'm just telling folks about how an infrared telescope works, which is basically you have to be colder than the object you're looking at. Um, so the Webb has to be at minus 223 Celsius or about 50 Kelvin. So super, super, super cold. That's right. Yes, and I'm sorry about that. My Someone just walked into my house and the dog went nuts. So sorry about that. I wasn't expecting that. So yes, that's absolutely right. That In order to see things in the infrared, which is what um, James Webb will do, we need to be able to um, uh, get these temperatures of these instruments down very, very cold. And it's got this elaborate, if you've ever seen a picture of JWST, it's got this elaborate sun shield uh, mechanism in it that uh, is designed to keep the sun on the other side of that sun shield and act as a radiator so that by the time the the part there it is that's a good there's like five layers there and each layer is gets it progressively colder and reflects more and more um, uh, heat away from the instrumentation which is just on the other side and that stuff is as Jared said has to be down to like 30 I think it's 30 degrees Kelvin is how cold it has to get. It's pretty cold. And that's so it's, it's, yeah. And that's, and that'll be the coldest anything's ever operated in. And also the, uh, because of the way this, the size of this telescope, it has to be folded up in kind of an origami, really complicated way that, um, uh, so it'll fit inside the Ariane 5 rocket. And so that's a, uh, that's a, another big complication to this thing. And, one of the reasons it's taking so long is that no one has to build this telescope as no one's ever done it. Uh, and the Northrop Grumman Corporation that's, that's in charge of the main contractor that's in charge of it had a lot of problems dealing with that sun shield. And so finally it's, it's been worked out. They, they, they were unfolding it and unfolding it back up again. Uh, and they were having trouble doing that. So, um, uh, that was, uh, that was another big reason for the delay on that as well. So it's been a real fiasco in many ways. I, I used to, I was a real JWST fan. I still am, but now it's like, wow, really? Are we still, the thing ended up costing as much as an aircraft carrier costs. It's like $9 billion to build this thing. Now mm -hmm. I still love it and I still want it to fly. I would spend $9 billion on it. I don't have a problem with it. The problem is <laughs> it doesn't have good optics, right? I mean, this is, I mean, the optics it has good optics, but it doesn't have, this doesn't look good for NASA to be spending so much money. Uh, on on such a, a project like this, so they've taken a lot of heat and flack for it. Mm -hmm. Still, though, I'm I'm I would much rather this is to me. I don't care what JWST costs. I think it's worth spending the money on. But then you know, I like this stuff, and a lot of people have trouble with uh, appreciating the amount of money this thing is actually costing so mm -hmm. yeah There's and uh and i sort of like half jokingly refer to it as the telescope that ate the budget because it kind of did um, oh you did well it, the science directorate into this they're the ones the ones that are that are paying for this the science directorate uh has you know they they haven't canceled any other projects because of it but they there's some have been delayed so yeah, it's, it's definitely the behemoth in the room right now. Yeah, and the telescope that will also be coming after it, WFIRST, uh, Wide Field Infrared Survey Telescope. Um, That's right. That one is, uh, luckily that one is, is so far on schedule and on budget with what they're expecting um, to have with that there. So 
uh, pretty good. Uh, I guess they've right. learned their lessons from James Webb and uh, and kind of integrated uh, those lessons as well. And uh, well, they also got a head start though. W first yeah. was one. I don't know if you remember back in 2011 ish or something like that. The National Reconnaissance Office gave NASA two Hubble like telescopes, two chassis. Mm -hmm. They were the optical assembly that was identical to Hubble as well as the the spacecraft bus and all that stuff. They had two of those sitting around. Now, why <laughs> the NRO had two Hubble Space Telescopes <laughs> lying around, I don't think we want to know the answer to that. But um, they gave they gave them to NASA. NASA said, well, hmm, what can we do with these? And they designed W first to do it. Now, that's a good image of the, uh, of the comparison between the two telescopes. You can yeah. see the uh, 2.4 meter diameter of the Hubble telescope versus six and a half meters uh, in diameter of the primary for the JWST. So we're looking at a huge amount of capability here. Yeah. Also in that JWST image off to the right of the JWST um, uh, heat shield, you see a little thing hanging down. That's a momentum flap. And that's designed to actually uh, steer, not steer, but, but correct for the solar wind so that the telescope doesn't get uh, blown around too much. And that helps correct this, the, the telescope for the solar wind. So that's kind of cool. Yeah. And we've got Love that uh, term momentum flap. Yeah. I like that too. It's like solar, it's <laughs> sailing. So not only do we sail across the seas, we sail in space uh, as well. And um, we've, we've already got like a multitude of questions about uh, James Webb. And I feel like uh, one of them is pretty like, it loops back to the fact that uh, the National Reconnaissance Office basically told NASA, hey, we have two obsolete telescopes. You want these? Um, and then NASA got them and said, whoa, these are good. And then we're all like, what? <laughs> obsolete? Huh? Uh, so yeah. uh, Sparker on YouTube is asking, if this was used as a spy telescope, what would the resolution of a photo from low Earth orbit be? And I think I can answer this, but I also kind of want to throw it to you, too, which is... Uh, what do you think? <laughs> you mean if you pointed James Webb to uh, Earth or the one of these Hubble? It seems to be things? that uh, that they're asking about James Webb. Um, I know that the that the National Reconnaissance Office stipulated to NASA that they could do anything they wanted with the telescopes is, that, that they donated as long as they don't point them back at the Earth. So <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. Well, all of the well, luckily for NASA, the instrumentation that does good astronomy is so sensitive to light that pointing it at Earth would just ruin them. Mm -hmm. So they wouldn't have that interest anyway. Yeah. Um, and I don't, I mean, other than some climate studies that NASA does with a lot of their weather satellites and, and geo, uh, geo study as, uh, as satellites that they have, uh, the higher, the, this kind of resolution is not necessary. Mm -hmm. but, um, uh, but, for, but if, so you're asking, what if JWST were to look at the Earth, what could it see in res terms of resolution? Uh, well, theoretically, if you do the math of the – and resolution is always a function of the wavelength you're looking at divided by the diameter of the telescope. Or no, it's multiplied by the diameter of your telescope. So you, you take whatever wavelength, let's say uh, 700 nanometers is, is kind of in the red, I believe, and you look uh, – you multiply that by the diameter of the telescope in uh, meters, uh, you'll get some number of um, – of uh, uh, let's see, wavelength would be in per meters, and uh, at l the diameter would be in meters, so they would cancel each other out. You'll just get some number, whatever that is, and that'll uh, you could get you'll get a sense of what uh, it can view. Now, I'm guessing, but I can't imagine that it couldn't because I'm not doing the math in my head. But it would be something like um, if you can't read a license plate with it, I'd be so I'd be shocked. Yeah, that would uh, it would definitely be a pretty potent instrument um, in order to yeah. do that, and also for Spark. And that's at the L two point. Yeah, that's right. Um, just <clears throat> so everybody is aware, we're, it is being flown to the Lagrangian two point, which is the uh, balance between the Earth and the Sun's gravity directly behind the Earth, uh, which is about one point six million kilometers away from us. Um, and they're doing that because you can drop it there and it basically stays there because the Earth and the Sun's gravity balance it out. You have to do a little bit of motion, what we call a halo orbit. You kind of go around um, that area with that there. Um, but, but if you put something there, it'll tend to remain relatively stable and stay in just about the same place. Um, doesn't mean they don't have propulsion on it. They still do. They have the capability to move it. They have reaction wheels, so they're going to use those thrusters to desaturate them or basically uh, allow the reaction wheels to lose some of their momentum or build up some momentum and then 
still be able to use them to control the telescope. Um, and, uh, and, you know, also it's further away from the Earth, so that means you get less infrared interference um, from the Earth, as well as the moon as well. A lot of people don't think about that. Um, is that you, it's not just the sun you have to block this thing from, it's the Earth and the moon at the same time. You want to make it as cold as possible in order for it to work as best as it can. Yeah. So. Right. And uh, I just want to clarify something I just said about angular resolution. So it is, uh, it, I, I said it was the product of the wavelength times the diameter. It's actually the, the quotient of the wavelength over the diameter times a number, just a constant 1.22. So when you divide the diameter into the wavelength, you get a dimensionless number. And that's your angular, angular resolution. So in radians, I think. So you can figure it out if you just want the diameter of the James Webb Space Telescope is 6.2 meters. Divide that by whatever wavelength you're interested in. Pick something in the middle of the uh, of the uh, optical range. Although JWST is not that sensitive, it's mostly an infrared telescope, uh, and you can get your answer and multiply that by 1.22. So it's a pretty simple thing to figure out uh, if you want to know what kind of things it can see on a on a planet. And that's why D, the diameter, is so important. Um, JWST is going to have a big. <laughs> Really big mirror. It's a so big. Really How big, big uh, is it? Big, so. I, was, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if it's a pro. I was going to say it's got a really big D. But <laughs> well, I mean, it does have a but, big uh, diameter. So, it's, I mean, that's. Uh, I'm, what's that? I'm just throwing it out there. It is a big diameter. So, you know, that's a, yeah, it's a big yeah. boy. So, that's how it goes out there. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. So, no, it's, right. it's, it's, it's so, okay. anyway. <laughs> also, Sparker, um, it, just in case you're asking also about like those Hubbles that look at the Earth that the National Reconnaissance Office apparently has, um, those, the, from what I understand, under the best possible conditions with those, you can get like one third of a meter resolution out of them. But that's like the best possible, perfect conditions. Um, if you want to know more, uh, actually, about a foot and a half. Uh, yeah, if you oh, want to know about a foot, actually. Yeah, if you want to know more, uh, just a couple weeks ago, uh, someone from the executive branch tweeted images uh, that came from a KH-12, which is the the very advanced uh, optical satellites. I won't say who it oh, was. Oh, was that? I was that I, what it was? That was that the same kind of optical system? It sure was. So uh, I won't say oh. who tweeted it, but you could probably figure out uh, who it was. Um, and uh, we uh, unsure if that was derezzed or not, but it was definitely declassified instantly. Um, so there you go. You can also go look for yourself uh, because a yeah, lot of us were yeah, like, we're never going to see what tweets, those. Yes, a yes. lot of us were like, we're never going to see what those images would look like. And guess what? Uh, so also, <laughs> uh, Trey Harmon is actually asking a uh, very good question, um, which is, is ESA our only option for launching JWST or did they give us a good deal? And I believe that it has to both contend with um, uh, we'll fly an instrument if you give us your rocket and then also the payload fairing size of the Ariane 5 uh, is, the, is the largest of the payload fairings of rockets that are flying right now. So you could fit a very tightly folded James Webb inside of it. Mm -hmm. So. That's right. And yeah, what, you're right. So when you design these telescopes, you have two things you've got to answer. What are your science requirements? And then what are what what do you need to build to meet those science requirements? And out of those uh, science requirements, we want to see the first galaxies. We want to see the first stars. We want to see and resolve planets around other stars. All of those were science requirements. And they say, well, what kind of telescope do we have to build to see this? And out pops the James Webb Space Telescope. And then the problem is with these large space telescopes, and they're going to get larger with things like Louvoir, uh, then what? how do we get them up into space? And so you have to look at the largest rocket. And you're right, Jared, it was the, uh, the Ariane 5 was the largest at the time. And so they had to say, okay, it's got to fit in this rocket. So go build it to do that. And uh, that's what they've been working on since forever. And now it's ready to go in an Ariane 5. The problem is the mission has been delayed so much that the Ariane 5 is actually scheduled to be decommissioned uh, in 2020. <laughs> so they're not going to use, they're going to have the Ariane 6. And um, you can't just change it. You can't just say, well, now we want to go on a six. You can't. You have, you're stuck with what you built this for. So the ESA is, uh, 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 is or Ariane space, I should say. I don't know if they're quite the same thing, is agreeing to keep uh, the Ariane 5 available for this particular launch. 
So that was a little bit of a scary time when, you know, they delayed it yet again. Yeah. Uh, it was like, well, you know, guys, we're getting rid of the Ariane 5 here. Uh, you need to hurry this up. <laughs> yeah. And so that yeah. happened. Yeah. So uh, very interesting stuff with James Webb. And of course, we're going to watch it because like we're getting so close to it. Um, and then uh, just to let everybody know as well, just so that they're aware, um, from launch, which is supposed to happen, I believe, March. It's scheduled for March 31st, 2021. We'll see what happens right. with that there. Um, right. I, I imagine a, yeah. like there's definitely a couple of weeks of flexibility built into that there just because of how it goes. Um, but once it launches, it's going to take about a month to get out to L2. And then as it's doing that, it's going to be unfolding on its way out. So for the first seven days, they're basically going to get all the stuff that they need to communicate and, and operate and, and, and control James Webb with. But then for the two weeks after that, like day eight through 20, that's when all the stuff starts unfolding and coming together and, and really start like going with it. Um, so um, even so, we're going to obviously hold our breath for the launch, but then we're going to hold our breath for another month as it starts to unfold, and we want to make sure that everything. It's actually like six correctly. weeks after launch before you get first light, and yeah. it's going to be, yeah, all yeah. of that's going to be tense. It's yeah. going to be tense because think about it: one thing can you know goes wrong. Mm -hmm. It's just oh, don't even want to think about it. Yep, I'm not thinking it's about just it. It's going to be it's um, going to be scary. <laughs> and also, uh, they're launching James Webb intentionally out of focus as well because each mirror there has the ability to be dialed in to precisely where it needs to be at, and they're going to do that during the the commissioning phase in the first six months of the mission there. So actually, as we as we had in earlier this year. On one of our episodes, we talked with uh, someone from the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, they actually said that basically we're, the first images we're going to take are going to be these fuzzy dots of target stars that we already have in plan. And then we're going to mm -hmm. move each mirror individually. I think it's something like one ten thousandth the width of a human hair. They can even angle it like something like one millionth of a degree you know, per movement if they need to for all of these mirrors to finally focus up and get it ready to go. So, so it's launching already out of focus, um, just like Hubble, um, but unlike Hubble, they're accounting for it and they have a system there that can actually fit that. Uh, right. it, so. Yeah, it's expected this time. Yes. So, uh, <laughs> glad you put, I'm glad you pointed that out. Yeah. Um, and uh, some other things that we talked about uh, from uh, Isaac X on Twitter uh, was asking about certain planets that have not gotten their own probes in a very long time, which was how about Uranus and Neptune, you know, getting their own probes for further exploration of them. Because we've only studied them very close up with Voyager 2, with Uranus in 1986 right. and Neptune in 1989. That literally means that since I've existed on this planet, we have not visited either of those. Um, we've, we've looked at them with Hubble, we've looked at them with ground-based observatories, but nothing is as good as like actually getting out there and studying them with that. So what does that kind of future look like with those kinds of, uh, with, with those what we call the ice giants, uh, Uranus and Neptune right. out there? Because I know that they're, they're very much a, a, growing, a, a growing part of the planetary science community that wants to send a mission back to either or or even both of those planets. Yeah, the people I know at NASA are extremely interested in getting back to those planets. The thing about NASA, and we've all noticed this, is that they 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 have to prioritize uh, what they do because of the amount of money that they have. Now they do incredibly amazing things with the what I think is the minuscule budget that they have, and you know if they were given. Uh, you know, even slightly more money. I mean, what is it? I think Neil deGrasse Tyson always likes to say it's like less than a penny per dollar of our taxes go to NASA. Half a penny, roughly. And we get all these other things out of it, right? Mm -hmm. um, well, just for just maybe two pennies, you know, we could do, what could we do with that? You know, that would double NASA's budget. Uh, and so, you know, it, it, it boggles the mind to think about what's possible, but what we're not achieving with, with our capabilities. And one of those things is Uranus and Neptune. Now, They've had to prioritize in the sense that what they've picked, I think, are amazing missions coming up. The next biggies are going to be the Dragonfly mission to Titan. Absolutely should do that. One. Yes. That one's going to be awesomely fun. I mean, who the heck doesn't want a nuclear-powered quadcopter sent to Titan? And then there is the Europa Clipper mission to go to the moon of Europa. Now, these are two moons in our solar system, which are incredibly interesting because they might harbor life. Uh, they, at least what they, we, we can get a sense of what the conditions might be to have life there. Uh, 
And so those are their high priority things coming up. But people are now starting to talk about Uranus and Neptune. We don't know much about them other than the observations we got from Voyager 2, like you said, as well as the Hubble observations that we get recently. And Neptune in particular is important because it's got a lot of interesting things going on that we have no idea what's happening there. We see these dark spots. We see these light. Yeah, there, there's a great image of one, I believe. Is that a... Um, is that a that's a Voyager image, I believe. Yeah, that's Voyager sure 2 exactly. with the, the great um, dark spots and the little dark spot below it there during its flyby in 1989. Yeah, what's going on with that? I mean, that's really cool. Why, you know, what you know, these 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 features are something we're just not um we're just not looking into. So they are starting to, and I think the thing about these missions is that they, you know, they 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 take not a lot not a long not only a long time to get approved, but you gotta do the science requirements. Like I said, you got to figure out what kind of spacecraft you want to build, and then you've got to launch it and get it there. Remember, New Horizons, we waited nine years for that to happen. So we got to do something better about getting us out to these outer planets. And just last week, I did a hangout with some guys at NASA about nuclear thermal propulsion, which promises to get these space probes out to uh, these planets in much faster times uh, that we you know we're talking maybe one third of the time as it would have taken to get uh, as with just using chemical rockets. Imagine nine years being cut down to three, right? We can get to Pluto in three years. That would be amazing, uh, and it would cut down a lot of this waiting time that we have to get. So we've got a long wait before we see any direct probes getting to Uranus and Neptune. But we're starting now. NASA's starting now to think about it. I think ESA is also doing some work on this, and but. Once that's all built and ready to go and approved, you still got to launch the thing and wait for it to get there. Uh, chemical rockets are really starting to become obsolete with deep space planetary exploration. The next generation of probes are going to have, I think, nuclear thermal propulsion. So that look forward to that. That's a huge development. Yeah. In exploring our solar system. And what's nice is that budgetarily, NASA is getting thrown money to start actually restarting these programs for nuclear thermal rockets. So that was something that was studied yeah. very heavily in the well, late Well, it's because 60s. it's part of the Lunar Gateway. They want to build yes. tugs mm -hmm. for the moon. And, and, you know, it's also part, it's not part of Artemis exactly, but it is part of uh, the lunar, cis lunar plan of like using this propulsion for lunar stuff. So, yeah, yeah that's why. Yeah. And, uh, and, and there's. there's you know, I know that there's uh, some talk about the big decadal survey that's going to be coming up, which, uh, for those of you who don't know, about every 10 years, um, the planetary science and astrophysics and astronomers kind of get together and they basically have a big meeting and they say, what are our priorities we should have for the next 10 years? What are the things that we should really be focusing on? So back in 2010, when that, that decadal survey came out, James Webb, right at the top, um, and then right below it, Europa Clipper, and then right below it, some sort of Mars sample return mission, which is what they were they were talking about at that time. And then just below that, W first. So those are sort of, so James Webb on its way, Curiosity, good to go, W first on its way. And, and as we found out um, just, a, just about a week ago, the Mars sample return stuff is starting to maybe get some money thrown at it um, in the upcoming 2020 fiscal year budget for NASA there. Um, so with this upcoming 2020 decadal survey, um, sort of, do you think, Uranus, a Uranus and Neptune mission are a part of that? And also, like, what do you think are sort of the things that are going to be on that survey? No, I think the next the next big things in, in the Decadal survey, I think, are going to be between uh, the Lynx Space Telescope, which is a new generation of X-ray telescopes, Louvoir, which is going to be even bigger than the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, it stands for Large Ultraviolet Optical Infrared uh, Space Telescope, and it's mm -hmm. going to be wide-ranging. Uh, wavelength telescope and then they've also got uh, there's exo there's a couple of exoplanet missions being thought up and th these are people who are already and I've talked to all of, all of these missions already who are pu putting in proposals for this decadal survey to get picked my money's on Louvoir uh, mm -hmm. uh, to get picked because that will be the next generation large space telescope that will go up um, but that's what I think is coming down the pike these other ones that uh that would do a Europa or a, I'm sorry, a uh, Uranus or a, a Neptune mission, um, I think would also get done uh, on the same scale as perhaps something like New Horizons. These are different scale missions because Louvoir would be part of their great observatories mission. And, mm -hmm. and uh, New Horizons was part of its discovery class, I think, uh, mission. So it'd be, I think, something on, these are missions that cost about 500 
million to a billion dollars, something like that. There are a certain class range of mission. I think the those missions would fall under that. They would still get done. Uh, and I don't know where they would fall on the Decatur survey, but the number one thing that comes out of the Decatur, Decatur survey always gets built. Mm-hmm. And in, as you <laughs> pointed out in the past, that was uh, JWST. Hubble was also in the top of the list many, many decades ago. And then uh, W first being another one. So these are all things that scientists get together and decide what do we want the most from NASA? And uh, what are our biggest, hi- I shouldn't say from NASA, in the astronomy community, what do we most want to learn? And then NASA looks at that and says, okay, well, here's what we want. to. We'll pick one of these. Mm-hmm. And uh, like I said, my money's on Louvoir, but there's another one that's an exoplanet-specific telescope that might work, too. They, that one's looking at directly imaging exoplanets only. Um, yes. that, one's a, that one's another big one. Yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, somebody was actually in our chat room earlier asking about, like, what's the next thing after James Webb and Louvoir would, uh, would be it, which if I That would be right. my money. We don't know it exactly yet. Yeah. <laughs> The thing about it is JWST is going to give us a lot of experience in these origami, origami-like telescopes, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, they want to build uh, telescopes that are, that, that are 10, 20 times larger than James Webb. And so um, these, how, how are they going to do it? You know, probably after James Webb, I can't, you know, this is already maxing our heavy launch ability. You're probably looking at assembling them in space somehow after mm-hmm. this. Louvoir. Uh, it would be launched, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, it would be launched in segments and, and, and assembled in space. And uh, it, it would be impressive. It would be really impressive. But we get a lot of experience already from James Webb for the next generation of these. So while people have gotten a lot of flack over James Webb, people get really angry at NASA because it's taken so long. You know, I, the, 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 the level of difficulty here is truly astonishing. Stuff had to be invented that did not exist. And that's also part of this the Cato survey. It's like when they go to make a proposal, they have to state how much of their project depends on something that something that doesn't exist exist yet. And JWST was full of it. Uh, it was full of you know uh, materials that didn't exist, lightweight materials. It didn't uh, it didn't uh, hinges and and all the boring stuff. All that stuff had to be invented, and beryllium had to be used, and uh, uh, detectors had to be invented that didn't exist before JWST was conceived. And so they build that in. They say, well, this amount of stuff we have to invent. And if it's really high percentage, it probably won't get picked. But something like 20 or 30 percent, they say, okay, well, we have to invent this kind of technology. We've done this before. We'll do that again. Uh, They have a risk management way of figuring that out. Not like that flippant way I just said it. But, you know, it is part of the, the planning process. How much of this stuff doesn't exist? And we've worked out so much of this technology already with JWST. It's going to help a lot with the with future uh, space telescopes. So I'm excited about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I can already uh, sort of uh, feel that people in the comments are going to be saying, we'll just stick Louvoir on a a SpaceX Starship and launch it that way. But from my understanding (laughs) of Louvoir is that it will be too big, even that, for a Starship to fly it. So so on-orbit assembly is one of those things that uh, definitely worth looking into um, with that there. So... Uh, yeah. there's been some interesting stuff flying around our solar system. You know, in the past couple of years, we've discovered these sort of what I guess most of us are now referring to as interstellar interlopers, which are these, these objects <laughs> that we have basically confirmed have come from outside of the solar system and are, you know, just passing through, whipping past uh, as they go through. So the first one uh, was back in 2017 with Amuamua. Uh, with that there. Um, and then we just found another one uh, about a month ago called, it's now called Borisov uh, after the amateur astronomer who discovered it. So by the way, if you think that all of this stuff is just done by universities or all these big names like Keck or Gemini or, or Canary Islands, Grand Telescope and all the other stuff, no, they're just, uh, Borisov was found by Borisov himself from basically his backyard telescope that he had uh, with that there. Um, So is this sort of like, are we just now discovering these because we finally have the technology to do it? Is that kind of where we're coming in with it? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. I mean, we're, we're seeing these uh, a lot more because we do. Yeah. Because we're looking for one thing. And second is that we do have the technology. It's gotten better uh, ground. I mean, stuff that amateurs can buy now is incredible. It rivals anything you can get in a ground based observatory almost anywhere uh, between, you know, companies like plane wave and other, and other big instrument makers. You can just really go to town on doing real serious science. And so discovering comets has long been an amateur activity, but this is, this is a new one because these objects are generally quite dim. And the way you know, something right now they don't know for sure that this one this comet uh, uh that uh, i forgot the name again but this latest one is from the uh is from uh interstellar space they're not entirely sure uh it will depend a lot on its trajectory and that's how you know mm-hmm. um most comets within our own solar system or most uh asteroids in our solar system follow a an elliptical orbit that's very characteristic of something captured by the sun so even if it's out of the ecliptic plane, which is where all the, the planets lie, they lie in this rough plane of, of, uh, around the sun, if a, if a comet comes way from the top and, uh, of that plane and then circles around the sun, it still might not be a, uh, from interstellar space. It could still be from the Oort cloud. It's just coming at it at a, at a regular angle, a, a, a strange incli- inclined angle. The way, you, the way you really know if something is from outside of our solar system is the hook it makes after it goes uh, around the sun. If it's sort of a check mark shape, you know, like a like a sharp bend around the sun, then it's that's highly irregular. It's probably not captured by the sun. It's just been, well, it's been captured by the sun briefly while it got slingshotted around, but it's not in an orbit around the sun. And that is in the, the indicator that it's from another, uh, another uh, outside of our solar system, inter- interstellar space. And Oumuamua, uh, followed that trajectory, but it was also out. It was on its way out mm-hmm. as we caught it. We we caught it too late, and so we could only see it as it was passing by. And Avi Loeb, as everybody knows, was saying, "Hmm, maybe this could be a uh, uh, an, an alien beacon of some kind." <laughs> and every, everybody everybody jumped on that. But I'll tell you, I, I I appreciate why Avi said this. And I had spoken to him in a hangout many years ago, but I also read his books and stuff like that. As he is he's, he firmly believes, and I agree with him, that it's totally time to start talking about this topic seriously among astronomers. They want the idea of extraterrestrial intelligence and, and alien life to be seriously considered and talked about within the astronomical community. When So when somebody like Avi Loeb, who is the chairman of the Center for Astrophysics at Harvard University, starts saying, well, you know what? It could be. He's starting a conversation among his peers that this is okay to talk about. It really is all right to say something about this. Yeah. And so I, I applaud what he's doing. Oumuamua is probably just a rock, uh, but it's not the point. The point is that he started making this conversation available seriously among the research community. And um, so yeah, and he took that, a lot that's, of fl- that's took, what... He took a lot of flack for that too. I mean, uh, oh, in, yeah. in putting oh, yeah, that out did. there. Yeah. But that's and, uh, what I mean. He, but he's got the the scientific standing. This is Avi Loeb we're talking about, uh, you know, saying this, and so he can. He's got a lot of academic capital <laughs> that yeah. he can use on this <laughs> and and bring to bear on it. And I think it's very, I think it's good because scientists are very conservative people. They don't want to rock the boat because they need funding, they need their research grants, whatever it is, and so they're very conservative in what they say in public, and. Um, they're also kind of belligerent to each other if somebody starts saying something really out of the norm. And so that's also a big history of, of, of science as well, part yeah. of it anyway. And I saw something really interesting about uh, this uh, uh, Borisov coming through, which is, uh, which is that we've caught this one inbound. Um, so we will be able to see it a little bit better than the Muamua uh, when it came through. Um, and, uh, the thing about it is, uh, a lot of people are like, well, just get a, build a spacecraft real quick and go intercept it. And, uh, that's a lot harder <laughs> than it sounds. Yeah. Um, and actually yeah. I just saw that somebody did publish a paper that basically figured out how would we have intercepted Borisov to basically do a flyby, um, of it with, with something. And they figured out that basically we should have first caught it well in time for us to build a spacecraft to launch it last year in 2018 to get it there. And that spacecraft would basically weigh 10 pounds. So it would basically be like a good, like a little bit bigger than a CubeSat. And then you'd have to launch this little 10 pound or roughly three kilogram thing um, on either a Falcon Heavy or an SLS in order to have it actually catch up and intercept Borisov. So uh, this is a lot harder than a lot of people think it is. 
uh, simply because these objects like Oumuamua and Borisov are moving at tremendous velocities as they come through our solar system. And, uh, and that's tough. Yeah, and I should also, I just want to add to that, that this is becoming a real priority for NASA. A lot of people are asking when we're talking about you, uh, Uranus and Neptune being a cool thing to do, but near-Earth objects are starting to become, inc I think they're woefully understudied by uh, all of us. And NASA has become quite interested in being able to detect these things early. And so they're working also on getting uh, spacecraft in orbit that are dedicated to it. Now, NEOWISE is up there right now looking, it's a wide field, infrared telescope designed to look at large areas of the sky at once. Um, but another thing that's going to help us out quite a bit are ground-based uh, sky surveys like LSST. That's coming online next year. Mm -hmm. And that will take an entire picture of the sky, the entire sky, two or three times every single week. And so we will have these enormous amounts of data coming down from the entire night sky twice or two or three times a week where we can then look at use computers to look at it and see more of these objects. So we're absolutely going to find more. We're going to see more of these interstellar interlopers, as you call them, uh, get through because we're looking now. We have better techniques to do it. Yeah. Uh, so that's also going to help. Yeah, Dr. Hewitt, who works at UCLA, actually came up to Griffith Observatory uh, shortly after Amumu was discovered and did a talk about these objects and what to expect. And he says that in his hypothesis was basically that within Mars's orbit at any given time, there should be about 25,000 of these objects just zipping through. That many, wow, really? All the way through. So that was, that was the idea oh. at that time. So um, with, with wow. Borisov now added in, potentially Borisov added into the mix, I'm sure that number is going to change a bit with that there. But that, at that time, that's what they were thinking about. So uh, essentially, once we get the ability, like with uh, the Synoptic Survey Telescope, you know, we might start discovering these things left and right as they're coming through. Yeah. Um, and also another cool thing to kind of talk about the uh, LSST, there a little bit is that there's so much data coming in from that that they actually had to figure out how <laughs> to contend with that data and analyze all of that data so that you could actually use it just because i mean it's literally yeah. s somewhere on the order of i think one night is something like nearly a hundred terabytes worth of data coming from it it's like mm -hmm. some ridiculous number out there with it so um right. And that and that kind of stuff, you can end up adding on to other things like uh, like, you know, analyzation of data coming from, say, like James Webb or other things. Um, and that just opens up the realm of possibility for what you can end up studying and how detailed you can end up studying these things. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we're looking at I, I met some of the people on the data management team, uh, shared office with one for a while and uh, on LSST. And we're talking billions of objects a night have to be sorted through uh, with computers. And obviously, no one, no people aren't going to look at it to get a sense of what's new, what transient objects are out there and uh, and things like that. And it's important. And in fact, um, you know, we were talking about what's it going to take to launch something out to like this this particular comet and do it quickly. Um, you, you're right; you can't do it very quickly. But what'll be interesting about studying this comet is that if we could get something there, co these comets have the potential to be responsible for depositing on planets like Earth uh, elements from elsewhere in the galaxy, and so these could be part of the span panspermia idea of of spreading life uh, across the galaxy. So n understanding these comets would be would be really great if we could get things out there to them. Yeah, so, and, uh, and it, I just kind of thinking as off a of practice, I just want to mention real quickly about Apophis. Apophis is coming up in 20, uh, uh, 20, uh, 29. Uh, 29 yeah. in about 10 years. And astronomers are planning. It's going to go so, get so close to Earth that it's going to fly underneath geosynchronous satellites. And astronomers are going to use that opportunity to actually one of the things we're thinking of doing is sending something out to Apophis as practice to see what we can do to get these near-Earth objects studied better. Uh, and uh, uh, so that I thought was pretty interesting, but that's not going to happen for another 10 years. Yeah, so. and actually just a couple of years from now, um, NASA is going to be having a mission called DART, the Double Asteroid Redirect Test. Oh. Where they're actually going to fly right. uh, two spacecraft to a <laughs> binary asteroid, where two asteroids are actually kind of orbiting each other, um, and they have an impactor, and they're going to basically fling an impactor into one of the asteroids and see what happens. 
So uh, does yeah. it, what's it do to the asteroid? How much does it deflect it? Uh, what happens to the other asteroid <laughs> orbiting around it as well? Um, so uh, it's going to be pretty interesting um, to play around with that and see what that goes. Because honestly, one of the biggest threats other than, than climate change that we're making ourselves, um, uh, the biggest natural threat um, besides what we make for ourselves uh, is a, an impact event. From some from something like a comet or an asteroid coming in, and it's I one know. of those. I can't believe we're not spending spending more time on this. Yeah, it's really, like hugely important. You can't like Armageddon it, where you've got like 18 days and just launch Bruce Willis and Ben <laughs> Affleck and hope for the best. Like yeah, you need God. 15 well, to yeah, 20. He's getting old, you know. We can't depend on Bruce Willis forever. He so is, we're gonna yeah. have to work out another another solution. Yeah, and I don't know if Billy so. Bob Thornton would really make a good NASA administrator, but I mean, hey, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I, I didn't yeah. I didn't think Jim Bridenstine was gonna be good. So who knows uh, with what's going on there. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I guess he's been a surprise. I was a little skeptical too, but I've been, I think, somewhat surprised. I mean, there's been some some stuff that hasn't been, but yeah. yeah um, well, my favorite way, though, my <laughs> favorite scenario for getting rid of a uh, rotating uh, uh, or a, uh, a, a, a an asteroid that's on a direct collision course, and this is a real plan, by the way, if we can detect it far enough away, the plan is, if there's a, a satellite or an asteroid heading towards Earth, we go to it, and we look at its rotation rate, its axis of rotation, and which way is pointing the, towards the sun. And we paint that side, we paint it white on that side. And the radiation pressure from the sun will reflect off of that white paint and push it just enough, maybe, hopefully, if we get it soon enough that it will miss earth entirely. That's my favorite plan. <laughs> I love that. Nice. I, when I first heard it's like, really, you want to go out there and paint it? I'm like, yeah. Might do as well. Banksy on it and stuff. Like, That'd be awesome. Yeah. So but, uh, that is an actual strategy. Yes, it for is. We're trying it. So and, maybe Sherman yeah. Williams can, can sponsor that mission. So <laughs> then they can Sponsored literally, Sherman Williams, they yeah. can literally cover a world. With eggshell white. So yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that'd be pretty good. Um, my favorite, my personal favorite for deflection is the gravity tractor. So basically, uh, for those who are oh, watching yeah. and don't know, you have an asteroid, you get, you basically fly the heaviest spacecraft you possibly can next to it. And then the gravitational interaction of the spacecraft and the asteroid will cause them to come together. But you don't let that happen. You have the spacecraft fire its thrusters so that way it just gradually pulls the asteroid out of the way. So it's basically like, it's like if somebody gets too close to you and you just like very gently push them very slowly out of the way. Um, that's kind of that's <laughs> how the, the gravity tractor works with that there. And it's, I don't know why, but that's it's a good plan. just amusing, uh, uh, infinitely amusing <laughs> to me. Um, <laughs> yeah. And I want to kind of talk. Just warp space time. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, why don't we talk about warping space time and some things that warp space time, like black holes, because everybody loves black sure. holes. Because uh, they're mm -hmm. just, they're so exciting. And we've had a lot happen with black holes this year. Um, uh, back in April, the Event Horizon Telescope uh, finally wrapped up crunching its numbers and delivered to us uh, the first image, first direct image of a black hole uh, in M87. Um, and uh, that M87 is a galaxy in the Virgo cluster. Um, and it has a supermassive black hole about three to six billion times the mass of our own. And it made this really interesting image that had sort of like this reddish ring around it. And, uh, and that was our first time getting a direct image of a black hole. And that was super exciting that we actually got to see that. Like, holy moly. I know. Right? Yeah, that was years in the making. And uh, uh, they... You know, there were some people that go like, well, I don't, I don't get the big deal here. What's the, what, you know, it's just mm -hmm. a fuzzy circle. Uh, but when you understand how that image was taken and what's behind it, uh, it's, it's actually nothing short of astonishing. I mean, yeah, we, first of all, black hole, there it is. There's a good, there's a good image. Yeah, of it. There first it of, black holes have not, we, they've up until very recently been a uh, theoretical construct. They came out of Einstein's relativity. We could do the math and black holes or singularities were part of that math. And they were an extreme case of Einstein's uh, theories uh, of general relativity. And we had, so everybody's like, well, they should be there. But, you know, no one really saw them directly. We had seen gamma ray jets coming from accretion disks. We had seen uh, radio uh, bursts coming out of them from other galaxies and other star clusters. And uh, uh, so we figured these must be due to, a, to material falling into a black hole. But that's not a direct observation of a black hole. That is the environment around the black hole and conceivably it could be something else 
But that made the most sense. But it wasn't until that image was taken earlier this year that we said, yes, black holes actually do, in fact, exist. And we now know it. We've seen them. Here they are. That is the event horizon. There it is right there. Um, you can see where the, well, there it is. Nicely, nicely annotated. Yeah, no so banana for scale. That's a big this. black hole. So, yeah, a little too big for a banana for scale uh, with that right there. Um, but it was, it was <laughs> fascinating that you looked at the simulation, the, simula the expected simulated image that came from the Event Horizon Telescope supercomputers when they did the crunching initially. And then you looked at the actual image that they got of M87 star, which uh, we call black holes. We usually add star onto it. So like the black hole at the center of our own galaxy, because it's in the constellation Sagittarius, we call it Sagittarius A star. So, so the supermassive black hole at M87, because it's basically confirmed now, we call it M87 star. Um, they looked at the simulated view, and they looked at what they ended up getting with the data, and literally, like, perfect match. It's very rare to actually see, like, a perfect match happen, but bam, there it was. Um, and that basically told us that uh, there it is, right there for us to look at. Um, and there was yeah. also another one I wanted to throw out here, which was a paper that just came out uh, a couple in the past couple of weeks, um, which talks a little bit about Planet Nine, which I don't think is correctly named for it. But I mean that we could have a whole episode. I think we've done several episodes about what makes. What's a wrong planet, with that? What, what's wrong with calling it Planet Nine? Well, I just I, come on. I mean, if we're gonna, it, this is like this is getting like ultra pedantic, and I just I don't want to get into this because. Uh, because it will just devolve into, I mean, I've been at conferences and I've nearly seen fist fights break out over, over what, if planet nine actually is planet nine or if it should be planet 10 because of Pluto and all this other stuff. And it's just like, I wish that kind of energy would be put into proposals for missions as opposed to, uh, right. to Twitter, Twitter reply wars. Okay. Well, it is that it would actually be planet nine though. It would be technically it, speaking five and 15. Yes, it would. Um, but there was, uh, th and they've been hunting for it for almost four years now. And of course, the observation time that you can do for it is right around this time of the year because they expect it to be pretty close um, to the constellation Orion. Um, but there was a study that just came out the past couple of weeks ago that says that maybe it may not actually be a planet. Maybe it's actually a primordial black hole. Now, this study wasn't necessarily thrown out there in what I would call like 100% seriousness. It was basically sort of like, let's throw something at the wall and see what sticks. Um, which, I mean, honestly, that's what a lot of science is. Um, and they basically said that this black hole would, would be a primordial black hole. So basically the kind of black hole that would appear in our universe um, very shortly after the Big Bang. Um, so that would allow it to remain very, very small in its mass because most of the time when we think of black holes, we think of like stellar sized black holes, you know, multiple times the mass of our own sun. But this one, they say, would be about five times the mass of the Earth. And one of the neat things in their paper is that they actually had a figure in it. And of course, if you read astrophysics papers and stuff, there's always figures and graphs and charts and other things. But Gotta this, have pictures. Yeah, this kind of just blew us away because they put in a one-to-one -one scale figure of how big the event horizon for a five Earth mass black hole would be. And that's and there it is. like one of the coolest things I have ever seen in a paper before. Um, that's my hand for scale, by the way, just to let you know. So it would be just about, I think it was four and a half centimeters, if I recall correctly, um, with that there. So uh, by the way, if you do find a five Earth mass black hole, don't put your hand as close to it um, as, as mine is right there. And I just love this at the bottom. Exact scale, one-to-one -one illustration of a five Earth mass primordial black hole. Like, I've never seen that in a, like I've never <laughs> I've never really seen uh, much of scale in an astrophysics paper, let alone a one to one scale with that. And that's a pretty interesting idea. And um, the one of the people instrumental in bringing up the hypothesis of Planet Nine, uh, Mike Brown, whose Pluto, whose uh, Twitter handle is brilliant, Pluto Killer, um, with that there, uh, he actually yeah. said on Twitter, uh, it sure could be. So he he kind of he kind of said, yeah, maybe. So yeah. Yeah, because the reason we know it's there at all is base is is or we think that it's there is that we're not seeing it directly. We're hypothesizing it's there because we can see the effect that whatever it is that is there has on the things around it. That's how we discovered Neptune. We discovered Neptune long before we actually saw it. We knew Neptune should be there. 
uh, because of the effect that Neptune, that a planet the size of Neptune would have on all the other planets around it. And sure enough, as telescopes got better, we found it. Uh, we looked at it directly. And the same's kind of going on here with this Planet Nine business. There's something out there that's affecting the, the orbits of things that we can see that isn't consistent with the stuff that we know is there. So something must be there. But it, 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 it's, it's, it's its gravitational field that we're actually noticing. And so it doesn't have to be a planet. Mm -hmm. It just has to have mass that would have uh, would the ability to warp space-time in a way that lets these things that we can see orbit the way they do. So, yes, it could be a black hole uh, about the size of, of, a, of five times the Earth uh, uh, that would go there. And it would be, in fact, physically quite small with a very strong gravitational well. So, yeah, it, it could absolutely be that. Uh, and the thing about black holes is that we've, as I just said with the, black, with the Event Horizon Telescope, we only just found out for sure that they exist. Black holes are black. They're hard to see. We only see them when they do things to other things like eat stars or gobble up gas and dust. Uh, that's when we know they're there. But imagine in the middle of nowhere is this teeny tiny thing about the size of your hand floating around, just distorting space. How are you going to see that? You, you're not. You're gonna, you're, you're, we're never going to be able to directly see that unless it starts devouring something really close by. Then we might notice it because there'll be some kind of an explosion or or energy release so as that thing gets sucked in. But yeah, they could be lurking everywhere. Yeah. And, and that's something astronomers have been thinking about for a while. Yeah. And it's, it's fascinating it be, it to think about that. Yeah. So, Tony, thank you so yeah. much for coming on the show. If people want to know more about you, where can they get the info at for that? Oh, just deep astronomy everywhere. Um, YouTube, Twitter, Twitch. Uh, I do it Tony's uh, Twitch Tuesdays, T cubed uh, on Twitch every Tuesday at three o'clock Eastern time. I'm on Space Junk Podcast. So please check that out um, and download it everywhere you can get a podcast. I do that with OPT telescopes. And uh, you know, every, every week we get together and talk about space. So yeah. That's that's how to get a, get a hold of me, and I want to thank you guys for letting me on. I feel like I'm I'm sitting at the big boy table now. I'm at the <laughs> I'm at the big you know the big boy table at the cafeteria or the the, the popular kids group. So thank you for for letting me uh, join in today. I really appreciate it. Well, we're glad to have you at the table. Come back to the table anytime you'd like to. So definitely, I'd love to, and love and to. definitely everybody go over and check out Tony Darnell and the work that they do. It's just fantastic with everything that you do. Go <laughs> throw your support well, behind you, them as much as you can because you guys just put out top-notch stuff and also wear amazing shirts as well uh with that so it's just it's just too good thank you yeah and speaking of yeah. support we of course can't do these shows without you here at tomorrow you help make these shows possible so if you would like to help support the shows of tomorrow what you could do you can head on over to patreon.com slash tmro or even youtube.com slash join and uh or excuse me youtube.com slash tmro slash join uh, you probably want to go to that one we really really like that on YouTube now because if you get something out of this, you can literally give us as little as a dollar per month to help make these shows possible. We can't do it without your support. We can't have the studio, this amazing equipment, the ability to deliver all of this to you, the ability to have myself come in and all those other people in the control room who do a fantastic job as well. This is your show and it's amazing that you folks feel that we are worthy enough to spread this out because this really does get to the core of our mission which is to make everyone excited about space in whatever way that we can so thank you so much for contributing to that and making that happen and if there's other ways you'd like to help out you can head on over to community.tmro.com TV as well and we've got some threads over there where you can do that or you can even start a thread and basically say like hey you know this is what I'd like to do for the show and we'll definitely pull you in and help you do that so that concludes orbit 12.30 until the next one keep exploring 